Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Anoma, and thank all the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present my work here today. So hello, everyone. I am Janki Raste. I'm currently a postdoctoral fellow at NCRA. And uh, this work was done in collaboration with Girish Kulkarni well, um, uh, from TIFR, uh, Catherine, Laura, and others. So very briefly, the history of the universe, which, I, which is the focus of my talk. So after the epoch of recombinations, we have this period called dark ages when the first, uh, when the neutral medium started, neutral baryon started collapsing into the uh, dark matter uh, halos. And these collapsed regions form the first sources of radiation. So this is called the epoch of cosmic dawn when the first sources of radiations are formed. And after that, these first sources started ionizing and heating up their surrounding medium. So this is called the epoch of reionization. Uh, but this is a very uh, brief, very inaccurate cartoon picture because very, we have very few observational probes to study this time period, uh, especially dark ages and cosmic dawn. So to understand what actually took place, what were the sources and how they uh, ionized, et cetera, we turn to the simulations. So we have, uh, in our work, we have used this uh, model of the simulations given by Kulkarni et al. in 2019. And uh, this simulation is in agreement with a lot of uh, indirect probes of the ionization state of the IGM at uh, lower redshifts. So for example, Lyman Alpha Forest and uh, Quasar near, zo near zones, et cetera. So these are the, um, with these observations, we have this kind of reionization history in which we, uh, we see that the uh, reionization ends at very low redshift, around redshift 5.3, and it's very patchy also. So uh, this is the reionization history that we get. We have on the left-hand side, we have uh, redshift versus the volume ionization fraction. So uh, we see that the midpoint of reionization takes place around redshift 7, and it ends at around redshift 5.3. And uh, this is in agreement with, uh, as I mentioned, some of the observational uh, constraints on the IGM at this redshift. Uh, this is also in agreement with the reionization optical depth given by Planck 2018, their latest results. So we contrast this, and we contrast this in our work with an early reionization model, which is very early, which ends at redshift around seven, and uh, uh, in fact, below redshift seven. And uh, in this, the midpoint of, uh, in this, the uh, reionization optical depth is uh, pretty large, which is in agreement with the previous uh, Planck data, but which has now uh, superseded by the better uh, results. So we have late reionization and patchy reionization. Okay. So uh, my work was to calculate the 21 centimeter signal power spectrum and bispectrum for this late reionization model. So bef uh, before going into details of that, very briefly, what is the 21 centimeter signal? It's the, um, the hyperfine state of the neutral hydrogen. The ground state of neutral hydrogen splits into two hyperfine states. The singlet state has a nuclear and electron spin antiparallel, and the triplet has them parallel. So when an atom makes a transition from triplet to singlet state, it emits a photon of 1420 megahertz, which corresponds to the 21 centimeter signal. Now, um, as mentioned by uh, Shikhar, this uh, 21 centimeter signal, the number density of atoms in the singlet and 21 uh, triplet states are determined by this quantity called the spin temperature, which is affected by the CMB photons, the collisions and the Lyman alpha photons. Uh, in our work, we have uh, in ignored the effect of the Lyman alpha, et cetera, which I'll mention next. But essentially when the spin temperature is larger than CMB temperature, then uh, the photons, CMB photons, which pass through this uh, neutral hydrogen cloud are seen in uh, emission. And when it's less, the spin temperature is less then it, they are uh, absorbed in emission, absorption. So we have this differential brightness temperature. Um, okay. So we have this differential brightness temperature, which depends on the cosmology, the last few terms in redshift. And at any given redshift, it also has fluctuations. So since in our work, we have ignored the spin temperature fluctuations, which is a very um, valid assumption towards the end of the reionization, because we assume there to be uh, enough heating, we can, uh, the most of the fluctuations comes from the uh, neutral fraction terms. And uh, we also have fluctuations from density and the velocity fields. 
So we see that for given reionization history, uh, which is here uh, uh, in the light cone plots, we have a large neutral fractions left towards the end of reionization at redshift 5.5 up to like 100 megaparsecs, which corresponds to then uh, positive brightness temperatures regions uh, at these redshifts. So given that now the reionization is late, we have large power spectrum compared to uh, previous early reionization models at redshifts between 5.4 and 6. Can we detect it? So to calculate its uh, prospects of detections, we have calculated the sensitivity of four uh, instruments, uh, interferometric instruments, MWA, LOFAR, HERA, and SK1 low uh, for 1080 hours of observations. And since the foregrounds are weaker at uh, higher frequency, which corresponds to lower redshifts, we have assumed that these foregrounds are going to be uh, limited within the wedge region. And uh, we have calculated the sensitivity for 1,000 hours of observations. And what we see is that these um, sensitivities for HERA, which is currently being built, and for SK, which is upcoming, um, uh, HERA has already started giving results also. Um, for them, these two uh, sensitivities seem very promising that we should be able to detect the signals in near future. Okay, so with this uh, encouraging results, we then turn to higher order statistics. So because this uh, power spectrum is sensitive to the scales of the regions, neutral and ionized regions, pi spectrum is also sensitive to their size, uh, shapes, which means that uh, we, will get, we will be able to extract more information about the geometry of this uh, time period uh, compared to uh, power spectrum. And also one, another motivation is that towards the end of the reionization, the neutral islands which are left are the lowest density voids which means that they are expected to be highly non-spherical, non-Gaussian, and um, uh, we expect them to have very unique bispectrum signature. So let's see. Okay, so bispectrum is essentially a triangle in Fourier space, but we, uh, and this triangle can be of any shape and size, but we limit our work to isosceles triangles. Now for isosceles triangles, uh, we can have two size. sides of the triangles are equal, but the third size can, uh, side can be uh, parameterized with a theta parameter. And uh, different, these different triangles are sensitive to different uh, shapes of the field. For example, equilateral triangle, the second, would be uh, most sensitive to uh, spherical regions um, given here. So this plot was taken from Hutter et al. And uh, uh, so these are some of the results finally. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have, uh, I mean, these are results for isosceles plots. So on left-hand side, we have uh, K1 sides, the equal to sides are 0.2. And on right-hand side, it's 0.5 for moving megaparsec inverse. On the uh, x-axis is the cos theta. And uh, as expected, the bispectrum has also, uh, is unlike power spectrum, is going to be negative and positive. So the uh, plots are in symlog. We have, we see that uh, towards the early, uh, the color represents uh, various redshifts. So towards the uh, high redshift, the uh, beginning phase of the reionization, the bispectra, 21 centimeter bispectra, is expected to be negative at um, large scales. They are always positive at small scales. And as the reionization progresses, as uh, uh, most of the universe becomes ionized, uh, we have bispectra of 21 centimeter signal becoming uh, positive. But towards the end of reionization, specifically at uh, large K values, which corresponds to small scales, we have these fluctuations, which is the black line in the second plot. This does not work. So uh, that one, uh, these are the, uh, this is the last redshift before the universe is ionized. So we have uh, these kind of fluctuations. And then um, to understand if uh, these fluctuations, okay, so uh, these are the, this is the signature which I was talking about. So um, finally to study the, the non-Gaussian part, the specific non-Gaussian part of the bispectrum, we can even normalize it. Uh, using this prescription, but there are other multiple prescriptions to use also. So in uh, this prescriptions, we have tried to take out the effect of the power spectra and only, uh, and which leaves us with the non-Gaussian part. And we see that these fluctuations are enhanced a lot. So this is, this, this is the expected signature of the uh, 
non gaussian um, uh, neutral regions neutral islands at the end of uh, reionization and uh, then just to make sure that this is not something in just one simulations we compare that with the early reionization simulation which i had mentioned and even if the reionization took place very early at different redshift we have a similar signature of the neutral islands at the end of reionization uh, and in the bispectra so finally to see what parts of this what uh, what exactly components of the bispectra is causing this kind of fluctuations. We have, uh, we have broken this bispectra of the brightness temperature into uh, two parts, the density and the neutral fraction. And uh, this is expected to be a weighted sum of all these components, the neutral fraction bispectra, the neutral fraction multiplied by density bispectra and their cross terms. So these are all of these components. We have uh, the largest one, the most uh, important one is going to be the neutral fraction by spectrum. So this is their sum, the weight sum here. And this is the by spectrum that we calculated the black line of uh, independently of the by spectrum uh, uh, of the brightness temperature Q. What we see is that they match almost completely, but there is some, uh, there is some discrepancy and that's probably because we have not taken into account the fact of velocity gradient field, which is a third term that should cause fluctuations at any given redshift. Um, and one more uh, thing to note here is that at this redshift, this is a redshift 5.6, we have the largest uh, contribution from uh, this shape is similar to pretty the neutral uh, by spectra. And we have similar things at redshift at the midpoint of reionization. The black and blue lines are pretty similar, uh, even towards the end of reionization, almost when the neutral fraction is around uh, 0.9. Only during the beginning phase of the reionization and the very end where there are these fluctuations, we have uh, brightness temperature by spectra uh, being somewhat different from the neutral fraction by spectra. So I finally end with my summary. We have reionization pretty late. Uh, this means this is a good news for observational from observational point of view. And uh, the bispectra is going to be important for studying the end of this uh, reionization neutral, reg uh, neutral regions. And uh, we are trying to understand their nature. Thank you. Thank you. So do we have questions?